we are going to be following the story from an episode of Botched and reacting here. This is Patia, and you can see that she has a reasonably good sized deformity on her upper lip. And she describes that this came from a basal cell carcinoma. That is the most common type of skin cancer. And we see more of those than all other cancers combined. Thankfully, basal cell carcinoma doesn't often lead to mortality, to death. However, it can be quite disfiguring as you see here. We're gonna follow along with her story and learn what exactly happened, but this is a story that I hear frequently in the clinic about patients in their youth laying out with Crisco or baby oil and iodine, trying to get the best tan possible. And unfortunately, that kind of behavior often leads to skin cancer in adulthood. So we're gonna follow Patia's story and then I'm gonna give you my thoughts on it. Meet Patia. Patia has a bad. A couple problem. years ago, had a little spot on her right upper lip area. I can't be happy in my life if I don't. This impacts her to make it better. every single day. I actually went to take my son to the dermatologist because he was struggling with some acne. And I asked her, I said, can you check this out underneath my nose? I had a couple little bumps that were clear that I thought were probably some clogged pores. But it so was looking like a pimple. So it sounds like what Patia had done was a procedure called Mohs micrographic surgery. She's not very clear in the video if they did a biopsy at that first visit when she pointed it out while her son was getting examined for acne. But a basal cell carcinoma can look like a small clear bump. Now this isn't to alarm anybody that you need to go and get every little bump checked out, but a small clear bump can be a sign of basal cell carcinoma. We sometimes will refer to them as a pearly papule or a shiny papule. Sometimes they will bleed easily and they can be mistaken for a pimple or a scratch um, or other small injury. But if not detected early, they can be growing not only on the surface, but under the skin. She was then scheduled for Mohs surgery, which is a process where we remove tissue around the area of cancer with a very small margin, check it under the microscope right away to determine if the cancer is clear, if all the margins are clear, or if we need to go back and cut more because the cancer is spreading beyond the area that we cut. So we look under the microscope and get immediate feedback. So the patient knows the very same day that the cancer is gone. They don't have to wait for results a week or two later to know that the cancer is out. To me, it sounds like there was a failure of education from the part of her dermatology team. And of course, we're only getting one side of the story, but it sounds like she wasn't educated properly about what could happen at this appointment. It does happen sometimes where we'll biopsy something and the initial pathology might say superficial basal cell carcinoma or nodular basal cell carcinoma. Those are very common and they tend to be the least aggressive, but there are exceptions. And then sometimes we'll start doing a Mohs surgery and we'll find that the part or the roots below the skin are actually a different type of basal cell called infiltrated basal cell. And those can spread very, very large areas under the skin, which is really scary if you're not prepared for something like that and can be scary even if you are prepared. Patia mentions in her video that they went back six times before they had the cancer clear, and that's a lot. So the average in my clinic and for most dermatologists is going to be between one and two stages. So cut once, it's positive, cut twice, it's out. So most patients are clear on the first or the second cut. On really aggressive tumors, it may be three or four cuts. When we start getting above that, we're dealing with something exceptionally aggressive. I personally have had cancers in my clinic where we've cut seven, eight times. I think the most I've ever done is nine times on a single patient. Most of the time, a Mohs surgeon will remove the cancer and then perform a reconstruction on the same day. I would say that in my clinic, I close 95% or better of the defects. So we'll remove the cancer and we'll repair the patient. If we go three or four stages, we still repair them in the clinic most of the time, but it, of course it's going to be a bigger procedure. When we start getting to something that is, you know, six, seven stages, the defects are often quite large and we're not only dealing with the physical problem, but potentially functional impairment if it's around an eye or a lip. And sometimes we will recruit in a plastic surgeon because the procedure is going to be so large, the patient's already been there for so long that day, and we maybe can't give them any more anesthesia without risking toxicity, so they need to be put to sleep to have the procedure finished, and most dermatologists don't have that equipment in their office. So I think it's appropriate that she was referred to a plastic surgeon 
for a closure on something that was really big. But again, it seems like there probably wasn't enough education as to what the process was going to happen for her. Hey guys, thanks for watching so far. I just want to interject for a second and let you know this video is sponsored by my skincare line, 208skin, 208skn.com. If you want to check out the products that I recommend in my clinic, you can go to this website and see the products that we use on our patients every single day, both for their daily skincare and post-procedure. Check it out and let me know what you think. The question is how much tissue is removed? From the nose all the way to the lip. That's a huge defect. Almost the entire upper lip is gone. So they did a skin graft and I was not the treating doctor so I can't really question the judgment here. All I know is that she didn't get a great cosmetic result. Sometimes a big reconstruction like this would actually be done better in a staged procedure where you reconstruct one portion and then you let that heal and then you do a revision and you maybe come back and thin the flap out or you do something else. She'd lost a significant amount of the structure there. She'd lost muscle around the mouth, so that's your obicularis oris muscle. And given all those things, she probably needed better blood supply up there, which is why they took part of the lower lip and folded it onto the top lip. But in doing that, it tightened the corner of her mouth and made it more difficult for her to open her mouth. What are your goals? What would you like to see happen? I would like to have more of an upper lip definition. I would like to have lips and a smile. So when we're treating something like a basal cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma with Mohs surgery, there's three goals to that procedure. The number one most important thing that we can do is to remove the cancer. If we do a surgery and we don't clear the cancer, we failed the patient. So clearing the cancer is the number one goal of Mohs surgery and Mohs surgery has the highest cure rates for basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma, particularly of the facial skin. The second most important thing that we do then is try to preserve all of the function. So this person, Pesha, needs to be able to open her mouth. It's impacting her being able to eat, take bites of food. So her function is impaired. And I think that's one of the biggest failures of the procedure that she went through is that the function was impaired. Thankfully, they did remove the cancer so that it didn't come back and cause further problems, but her function is now impaired. And the third most important thing is, of course, a cosmetic result. Most patients will prioritize the cosmetic result above all, and that's understandable when they may not have a full understanding of the physiology, the pathophysiology of the skin cancer. But from a physician perspective, when I look at a patient who has a skin cancer, the number one most important thing we can do is remove that cancer, make sure that their function, the function of their body is preserved, and then do everything we can to give them a good cosmetic result. So he took a flap like this, lifted this up. It's a good illustration. So if we can maybe lift all this up, try to debulk some of this even down here, that will hopefully, one, get rid of some of the fullness, two, give us a little bit of lift like that. So they want to widen the mouth, as he illustrated there, so that she can actually open her mouth. And then as they debulk, there's a lot of fullness. There's extra fatty tissue inside that flap that is making her upper lip look very full. So they want to debulk that. One of the biggest challenges with that that they'll talk about is where is the blood supply to that skin coming from? Because it was a flap, it's unpredictable. We don't know exactly what is underneath the skin when we get in there. So if they open things up and they start debulking that, it is possible to compromise the blood supply to that skin. And if that dies, then she's looking at a whole new problem. But hopefully what they're going to do is be able to pull the lip up pull out a little bit more of the pink part of her lip so that you see more lip on the outside and match it up to the other side. We're creating, you know, the new opening for where her lip should be. If I ruin that muscle around the mouth or it's not able to be fixated to the corner of the lip, the mouth function will not work and the lip will short. So they harvested the fat, they're putting it in there. The advantage of a fat graft over other filler is that the fat graft can be permanent. So you don't have to go back and get filler you know, every six months or every 12 months. The fat can actually pick up its own blood supply and really restore that volume on a permanent basis. Trying to match up one side versus the other. Symmetry is very important in facial aesthetics. If I gave her more red lip on the left as well, by doing a complete lip lift, that's gonna be an incredible win. Just making it look perfect. 
It's good judgment by the doctor mid-procedure, identifying something, and this would probably be something that he's discussed with the patient prior to about making small changes, and so he went ahead and did that. Hello. 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 How are you? Hello. Hi, guys. Well, let's take a look. So 11 weeks is lots of time to heal. So this is a great result. You can tell how incredibly sh happy she is with the transformation she's undergone. This has been a long road, a long journey for Patia. I can't help but notice, and again, this is completely speculation for me, in this photo, as she walks through her house, we can see some scars on her upper back and on her shoulders. It makes me wonder if she has had other skin cancers either before or after this. This was definitely the first time she'd been through Mohs micrographic surgery, however because she was unfamiliar with the procedure. Guys, that was an interesting episode on Botched, and they talk a lot about other things on that show with butt lifts and breast implants and everything else, but this was one about skin cancer, and I really wanted to react to it. Let me know what you guys thought about the episode. Comment down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and share this video with someone who might enjoy it. If you've had a journey with skin cancer yourself, let me know in the comments below, and I can do more videos like this in the future. See you soon.